I usually open up with this slide and it, it's really meant to illustrate that we can talk about what is a risk, uh, but I am a firm believer uh, in part because I'm an optimist that we should be also focusing on what are the opportunities. So how do we uh, drive innovation to ensure universal access to safe drinking water, healthy ecosystems, drive economic development and, and business growth. So left side of the tree, right side of the tree, I tend to focus on the right side of the tree, but I will frame basically what's wrong and what we need to fix. Why worry? Uh, there's a few reasons. One, uh, water is over allocated and undervalued. I think anyone in the water sector uh, can appreciate that. Uh, we really don't value water as much as we should and, and need to if we are in fact to solve some of these challenge, challenges. Uh, it's poorly governed. Uh, speaking from uh, my perspective in the American West, uh, Western water law is out of date and really is ill-equipped to deal with things like aging infrastructure, climate change, uh, urbanization, uh, and so on. Uh, water is mostly non-circular, uh, and we've got this nexus stress between energy, water, and food, uh, a lot of competition for water. And all of this is made worse by the impacts of climate change. It's a threat multiplier, basically. So. Uh, these are the reasons to worry. There's probably a few more, but uh, this is probably enough uh, for now. Uh, I talk about wicked problems, and I was introduced to wicked problems by a dear friend, Tom Higley, based here in Denver, that launched something called 101010, which is 10 wicked problems, 10 days, and 10 entrepreneurs that are uh, challenged to come up with solutions to those wicked problems. Wicked problems has a definition. Uh, these are some of the attributes, the two that are really important because it gets to the issue of how do we solve wicked problems, that wicked problems hardly ever sit within the responsibility of any one organization. So it, it really is not just for the, for the public sector or the private sector or academic institutions to solve this, we all need to. And some wicked problems are characterized by chronic policy failure, water, unfortunately fits very nicely into that and that public policy is not caught up with the realities that we face in the world of water. And this is a illustration that I've modified pretty significantly from Tom, but it's meant to illustrate how can we come together to solve wicked problems. And we have to be mindful that stakeholder groups like entrepreneurs, uh, they have great speed and focus but they don't really have scale. So they can move very quickly, but their impact, at least in the initial stage of their uh, launch is, is pretty small. The lower right, we've got the public sector, utilities, uh, NGOs, academic institutions that have greater scale, but they don't move typically as fast as entrepreneurs or investors or even the private sector. Everyone sort of sits somewhere in the middle depending on uh, which industry sector uh, a company might be in or the, the DNA, the uh, culture of the company, they might be closer to an entrepreneur or closer to the public sector in terms of their ability to have an impact at speed. And then of course, the civil society, how do we engage the lay person to think about the value of water and what they can do to accelerate solutions? So as we think about who can solve wicked problems in the world of water, it's really everybody. And the red circles are meant to illustrate sort of typically who hangs out with who in our nice little silos. So you see, for obvious reasons, investors working with entrepreneurs, you see the public sector working with utilities. Uh, and the goal uh, is really to break these silos down and bring people together to think differently about how do we come up with solutions to solve water. Corporate water stewardship and strategy, I make a distinction between the two and I will illustrate what that means and, and why I do that. And I hope there are a lot of questions on this one. Um, so uh, a number of years ago, I uh, was having a conversation with Stu Orr from WWF and we were thinking about the business growth strategies for multinational companies and the role of water. 
And this is really what it came down to is that, you know, it, if a company has very ambitious growth strategies and that growth strategy in part is focused on emerging economies and we recognize that in emerging economies, we have pretty significant water challenges, both from a scarcity and quality perspective. How do they reconcile that? How do they align their corporate water strategy with their business growth strategy? And that got us thinking about, well, how do you build a corporate strategy that really includes water, uh, not just as a CSR or ESG issue, but really as a strategic resource that's critical to grow your business from both an environmental and social perspective. When companies think about water as a risk, they think about it uh, with uh, three dimensions in mind. So there's physical, which is, do I have enough water of the right quality when and where I need it right now and go and projecting into the future, getting to that strategy uh, growth issue? Uh, what are the regulatory constraints, requirements uh, from a compliance perspective, again, right now, and what might they be going forward? And reputational risk. And I usually joke that anyone with a social media account uh, can comment positively or negatively on how you're managing their water. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward in a lot of ways to determine the physical risk uh, from a quantity and quality perspective, regulatory, not so bad. Reputational is pretty challenging because it's incredibly dynamic and uh, incredibly uh, impactful. When companies think about risk, uh, certainly the leaders uh, view water uh, across their entire value chain. So that is supply chain operations and depending on the industry sector, uh, product use. So if you're making soap, soap, shampoo, washing machines, jeans, you look at, well, how much water is being used in the product? Because if your customers, consumers don't have access to water, then you've got a problem selling a product. And a number of companies in that space spend a lot of time and money thinking about innovation as a way to ensure that people can use their products, uh, their services, either with very little water or no water. Uh, and then of course the risk dimensions on the left. What this all rolls up to is business value at risk for a company. And water is essentially free or grossly undervalued. So how do you get a company to think about the value of water to their business to ensure business continuity, business growth, brand value, then those companies can start to make significant investments in addressing uh, some of the more challenging issues associated with water. So this is my slide to illustrate the journey from water management, water stewardship to a corporate water strategy. And if you think about what's happened over the past 20 years, corporations have gone from really viewing water as a compliance or efficiency conservation issue, cost minimization, uh, perhaps some corporate social responsibility uh, focus. So the, the lower left here, and that delivers only so much business value or societal impact on the X axes. Uh, what has happened over the years is that companies have moved towards really thinking about water as a stewardship uh, opportunity. So they have engaged in uh, watershed level actions, uh, thinking about water across their value chain, collective actions, they call their engagement program, and they've made uh, just tremendous progress in terms of thinking about their role in society uh, to address water-related challenges. The first two categories, water management and water stewardship, primarily focus on water footprint. So how much water are they using across their value chain as a way to drive initiatives? What I push is the, the right side of this, a, a water strategy, which encompasses uh, some broader moving parts for a corporation. Um, it includes footprint, you know, volumetric calculations of how much a company is using, but also a handprint and uh, 
thanks to a, a good friend of mine who introduced me to the concept of handprint as it relates to carbon. Uh, but that's essentially thinking about what is the role of the company to deliver solutions beyond its footprint. And it goes back to the previous illustration, which is multinationals have big footprint scale uh, and can act with speed. So thinking about what they do best and leveraging that to solve water is incredibly powerful. So these companies that sit in this upper right uh, make significant investments in innovation, not just technology, but business models, uh, public policy, innovation, and partnerships. Uh, and they also engage in really much more uh, investment in their uh, agricultural supply chain, uh, education, advocacy, and again, uh, policy. So there's a few examples of companies that sit up in the upper right here that are really doing some interesting things and that creates a lot of value for them and for all of us. Uh, initiatives and trends, what are positive? You see more and more companies uh, engaging in strategies that include this message of being positive, uh, not just from a water footprint perspective, that volumetric piece, but also positive in the sense of what can they contribute to solving water related challenges. Uh, there is the Water Resilience Coalition uh, under the UN Global Compact led by the CEO Water Mandate. Uh, and this is very much a CEO led initiative, uh, commitments to reducing water stress by 2050. Uh, and they've got a number of initiatives under that. And I encourage you to take a look. There are a number of iconic brands that, that sit in this coalition. Just a few examples of companies that have a water positive strategy and narrative, uh, PepsiCo uh, being one of them. And I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit later. Uh, Google uh, has the same. Uh, Facebook, uh, currently known as Meta, they're interesting. They have a net positive message, but they have a volumetric set of goals and they have non-volumetric goals that they've established to, again, leverage who they are in the world uh, and have a positive impact. And also uh, BP, uh, one of the uh, rare ones in the oil and gas sector. Recently uh, with WWF, uh, we published a, a blog, an article on the concept of net zero. Uh, net zero has taken hold in the world of climate uh, and other issues like waste, uh, and is being adopted to varying degrees in the world of water. And our goal here was to be constructive with a little bit of pushback and really highlight that net zero as, as it's used in the climate change world doesn't really translate to the world of water. Uh, water is a local issue, it's not fungible, uh, has attributes that carbon doesn't have, such as social dimension and spiritual dimension. Uh, and we need to be mindful that that complexity doesn't really translate exactly to net zero. So if a company's thinking about net zero from a volumetric perspective, look, that's fine, that's you know replenish, um, that's a replenish strategy, but there are a number of other uh, challenges associated with really trying to reduce it to something uh, fairly simple. So again, this generated a, a fair amount of uh, spirited conversation, I might add, uh, in a good way, because the intention is always to see if we can do better uh, and break the status quo as much as possible. So a few examples of what I believe are interesting in the world of corporate water strategy. Again, that, that upper right side of the graph here. Uh, the 100 plus accelerator program was started roughly about three years ago by AB and Bev. And it was started because their CEO at the time and the company now believes they want to be a hundred year old company. Well, the, the reality right now is that if you want to be a hundred year old company, you need to understand the role that sustainability plays in driving your ability to grow and to thrive and to have a strong brand that people love. So they launched the 100 plus uh, sustainability accelerator. Uh, and what last year, yes, last year, they also brought in Unilever, Colgate, Palmolive and Coca-Cola. 
So suddenly they have amplified their impact, getting to that handprint uh, thinking and, and mindset that they would bring in other multinationals to identify uh, innovative technology companies in various categories, including uh, sustainable agriculture, climate change, water, uh, packaging, innovation, and a few other categories, and then help those companies by investing in them directly, uh, funding pilots and mentoring them and helping them scale beyond the startup stage. I, this, to me, this is really one of the more interesting, uh, innovative ways that multinationals can engage in driving innovation. Again, going back to that who solves wicked problem, these are multinationals now engaging with startups, entrepreneurs, and investors in coming up with solutions and also working with the public sector and uh, other stakeholder groups. Uh, this one's interesting, Microsoft, uh, for any of the folks here that uh, track what's going on in the world of climate change, uh, a while ago they, they launched their $1 billion climate innovation fund. Uh, water as a resource issue sits under this. That's a big deal. That's a big number. Um, they launched a few years ago AI for Earth. So they launched that as a way to provide technology support to innovative uh, NGOs, nonprofits, and uh, academic uh, institutions that are focusing on environmental issues. Uh, and Basin Scout is just an example of one that was launched by the Freshwater Trust. Uh, they've also invested in uh, technology venture funds here in the lower right, along with uh, Eagle Lab, uh, another multinational. So really interesting that they're doing a lot to address their water footprint, their water use, but also making direct investments and engaging with uh, other stakeholders in, in solving water challenges. Again, a little bit about the handprint uh, versus footprint. A couple of initiatives. Uh, Jesse uh, has been around for a while. It's a industry association for the information communication technology sector, ICT. And they were formed to really mobilize the ICT sector in thinking about how does their technology, information technology, communications technology, drive energy efficiency and address carbon emissions. Uh, they're also looking at water now. So again, what's the role of digital technologies and communication technologies in solving water in addition to them addressing their own water footprint. Uh, Digital Climate Alliance, uh, really interesting group uh, out of Washington, DC. They are focused on mobilizing, again, primarily the ICT sector to address climate change policy in the US. And of course, they have now brought in water into that conversation. Uh, and again, a, really an interesting way to bring uh, multinationals, technology companies, startups into the dialogue around public policy innovation to have a bigger impact beyond their footprint. Uh, healthy watersheds, uh, I talk a little bit about this uh, as it relates to the Colorado River Basin. Companies, uh, including PepsiCo and AB InBev, if you look at their water stewardship, water strategy, uh, initiatives, they are increasingly talking about healthy watersheds and what that means and their role in working with others, collaborating and making investments to ensure that watersheds are healthy uh, from an ecosystem perspective, uh, from the ability to deliver safe drinking water uh, equitably, to have enough water drive economic development, business growth. And I sit here in Denver, so the Colorado is important to me. We're one of the states that are uh, at the headwaters. Uh, and the, the report that is in the upper left here, we launched that in late 2019, uh, bringing together NGOs, uh, investors, technology companies, and multinationals to think about digital water technology applications in the Colorado River Basin that led to the lower left here, uh, a company called True Elements has essentially created a 
digital twin of the Colorado River Basin from a water quality perspective. And then last year on World Water Day, we launched the Colorado River Basin Fund. And uh, today on World Water Day, PepsiCo uh, announced their founding investment in the, in the fund. And again, I, I highlight this not for shameless self-promotion, but it makes the point that companies are now moving into doing some unusual things beyond just their footprint. So a company like PepsiCo or AV InBev, why would they focus on innovation? It accelerates them solving their own water challenges, but also has a, a bigger impact uh, for society and creates additional value. Uh, be remiss if I didn't talk about ESG reporting. Uh, ESG is a reporting strategy uh, and has gained a lot of attention. A number of startups are paying uh, a lot of attention to ESG reporting and baking it into their value proposition. Uh, so we see a, a real increase in how companies are talking about what a risk within the context of uh, ESG reporting, CDP you know, in particular. Uh, more and more companies through CDP talking about uh, water as a costly business risk and increasing uh, investment in uh, ESG initiatives uh, over the past five plus years. So interesting trend, uh, happy to get into a discussion about what that means for the water sector uh, during the Q&A. Uh, so innovation, uh, I'll come back to this quote a little bit later, but I just want to put it up there. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes that the future is in fact here. We just need to look for it and then help. It Smell them at water. I actually don't know what he's talking about. I have to go outside. <laughs> Let me ask you just to mute your microphones, please. Thanks. Uh, current uh, venture capital investing trends. Uh, a lot of companies are focusing on climate tech uh, in the area of uh, food, ag, and, and water. Uh, if you look at the right here, uh, venture funds are uh, really increasing their focus on the food and water. Uh, this is from Climate Tech uh, VC reporting. Uh, so things have changed. You're really seeing more and more investors focus on the issues that, that all of us are involved with in the area of water and how that intersects with agriculture, for example. Uh, this is from uh, Blue Tech. Uh, I think everyone here is probably familiar with Blue Tech and a really invaluable resource. Um, ignore the uh, reference on the bottom. That's a holdover from a previous slide that I failed to edit out. Uh, this is, in fact, from Blue Tech. Um, and this is what they're looking at for uh, 2022. Uh, the areas that I tend to focus on are uh, radical decentralization uh, or extreme decentralization and, and digital technology solutions. Uh, designer water point of use is another area, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, technology trends. I am a big fan of exponential technologies. Uh, I got hooked on that through uh, XPRIZE uh, and Singularity University. Uh, the two areas that I'm most interested in are advances in uh, digital. So data collection uh, analytics uh, example is Jive, a satellite data analytics company, Pluto Shift, an artificial intelligence company that works in both the utility and the industrial sector. Uh, then off to the right, advances in material science and treatment technologies. And these are three examples. Uh, Source is a air moisture capture technology company. They have a hydro panel. Uh, Evove, uh, graphene enabled treatment technology and AquaCycle, uh, really in innovative uh, treatment technology company that has leverage digital technology to provide real-time performance. So, you know, as you think about, well, what's going on in the world of water, exponential technologies are really, really exciting. Okay, watershed, smart homes, hydration, and extreme decentralization. That's certainly a mouthful. Uh, I'll touch on just a few things that I find to be interesting. And again, uh, hopefully triggers a little bit of Q&A. Uh, watershed health, as I mentioned, a number of companies are increasingly focused on watersheds as a way to think about 
uh, how they can address water scarcity, water quality, impacts of climate change, uh, equitable access. Uh, and uh, really what we're seeing is that NGOs like WWF and Nature Conservancy working with multinationals to address resiliency, sustainability at the watershed scale. So as a, a, a unit of action, it's uh, really incredibly appropriate. Some technology companies that sit in the watershed space, digital technology companies. Uh, so from a modeling perspective, uh, a couple of companies up here on the left, uh, climate and flood technology companies in the bottom here, uh, storm sensor, obviously uh, stormwater management, uh, leveraging digital uh, technology, cloud to street using satellite data, uh, and then monitoring. I mentioned Jibe using satellite data, True Elements, a uh, company based here in the U.S. Uh, full disclosure, I'm an advisor to them. Uh, they've accessed publicly available water quality data uh, to provide real-time water quality uh, information, actionable information, and predictive uh, analytics. And then uh, FredSense, another real-time uh, water quality monitoring technology company. Smart water homes, well, we've seen smart energy homes and water uh, has its time right now in terms of companies that are delivering technology solutions, digital technology, and also treatment technology to address water conservation, water reuse, real-time uh, water quantity and quality monitoring. And again, just a sampling of companies that are out there right now that are doing some really interesting things. So slowly we're moving more and more towards the smart water home. There is an initiative, the 50 liter home uh, Alliance that uh, is, is really doing some very cool things in terms of mobilizing different stakeholder groups to drive vastly improved water use uh, in the home on the demand side of the equation, but also democratize access to data. So giving you as a consumer homeowner information on water quantity and quality. Uh, hydration. Uh, hydration I hear is pretty important. So what's changed? Uh, we're seeing uh, water companies uh, move into water kiosks. And these are just a couple of examples, flow water and in-stream water. Uh, coincidentally, they're both based, based here in Denver. Uh, I often say that the water fountain is dead. Uh, killed by the pandemic, um, for better or for worse. So how does the consumer, um, regardless of where they're located, uh, get safe drinking water that is personalized for them, whether it's carbonated, still water, flavored water, whatever it may be. Uh, a couple of companies in the middle here, SodaStream was uh, acquired by PepsiCo a number of years ago, uh, Bevy. Uh, a startup company that delivers carbonated flavored water, again, uh, in, in different venues. Uh, Roshan, a startup uh, that was acquired, pod-based system for your home. Uh, and Rebo, a IoT smart bottle that will remind you how much water you're not drinking on a routine basis, uh, which is pretty clever. Uh, so really interesting space. Uh, and I bring it up because all of these companies uh, have digital uh, enablement to varying degrees, but again, giving you that, that personal hydration choice. Uh, extreme decentralization, uh, really interesting sector. Uh, we're moving to having other choices besides centralized systems. So localized water treatment uh, as illustrated by Organica. Uh, Hydroloop uh, for the home gives you the ability to use water more than once, uh, which is important in places like the American West that is undergoing aridification. And again, source with their hydro panels that provides uh, off-grid access to safe drinking water. And I think that is it. So my quote, uh, hope you keep it in mind. Uh, the future is in fact here. We just got to look for it and then we got to pluck them out and um, placing smart bets, helping them scale uh, and disrupting the status quo. So with that, uh, Fiona. Thank you, Will.